to do calculations for heat uh, for evaporators and the heat exchanger in an evaporator, we need a heat transfer coefficient here uh, for the heat exchanger. And how to do that? Uh, well, there are fancy ways to doing that. So, for example, pa Pacheco et al. in 2004 have an expression for overall heat transfer coefficient in an evaporator designed for sugar from, from sugar canes. And it looks like this. A rather difficult equation, right? So this is accurate, but for our purpose it's, it's totally unuseful. We need something much, much, much simpler and something that's generally applicable but perhaps not very accurate. Uh, and our aim is to make approximate calculations, not detailed calculations for specific uh, situations. And we want it to be based uh, on general principles and applicable to all kinds of evaporators. So what's happening? Well, if you think of the heat exchanger, uh, you have two sides, right? And a wall in between. And on one side you have steam coming in, totally dry steam. And what comes out is only condensate. So there are different phases here. And the process that happens here is condensation. And on the other side, you have a liquid coming in uh, with no gas. And it starts to boil. And boiling is a very tricky process to describe. Uh, and what comes out is a combination of gas and a concentrated liquid. Now, think through... How do you think the temperature, the overall heat transfer coefficient and the temperature difference between the two sides, how does that change along the heat exchanger? Uh, so you can think of different sections here. Uh, there's one section here where you might have overheated steam. So a steam with a temperature above its condensation temperature. And you might have a uh, part here where you have the condensate coming out at a temperature below its uh, condensing, uh, below the condensation temperature. And on the other side, you might have a point here where up to that point, everything is liquid. So try to make a diagram for temperature. So pause here and try for yourself. Well, the temperature on the steam side that's fairly straightforward. We said that it may come in at a temperature that is slightly overheated. So if this is uh, the condensation temperature for the steam, uh, it comes in at slightly higher temperature. And during the condensation, the temperature will be the same. And then we reach a point where everything has condensed and then the temperature might drop further. On the feed side, however, things are a bit tricky. So let's first look approximately how does this look. It looks approximately like this. So what's going on here? Well, uh, first, uh, the feed might come in at a temperature below the boiling point. So we need to heat it up to the boiling uh, point, the temperature at which this feed boils. But that's not everything that happens. You see, there is a maximum temperature. Uh, that looks strange, right? But the thing is here, we will assume in this course that you have constant pressure on the feed side. But in reality, you don't. Because in reality, in all kinds of flow, you have a pressure drop. So uh, there is a pressure drop, uh, meaning that if you have one pressure on where it comes out, you have to apply a higher pressure at the end where you push the feed into the to the system. So, uh, so the pressure is highest in the beginning, and then the pressure decreases due to the the friction. But if you think back back of the boiling point, the boiling point is dependent on the pressure. So, if the pressure is higher, then the boiling point is actually higher as well. So in order for this uh, feed to boil, you have to, in to increase the temperature to the boiling point of the particular pressure you have there and then. Uh, and once you, uh, so this is the point where it actually starts to boil. And when it starts to boil, some parts of it 
becomes a vapor and then the friction decreases a lot. So essentially uh, it flashes. Uh, once it starts to boil, it boils rather quickly and uh, the pressure is reduced and you reach the boiling point here. Or, uh, at the pressure uh, for what's entering on that side. We will assume in our, our course that we can say that the pressure drop is negligible. So, uh, but anyway, uh, this is what happens in reality. So let's try to simplify this to make it easier to work with. And we will simplify by saying that the delta T in the heat exchanger is simply the condensation temperature of of the steam minus the boiling point of the liquid leaving the system. So that's a bit different uh, than this, right? So we're essentially comparing this Ts here with this T down here and saying that that's the same throughout um, the heat exchanger. Uh, and note that T here is the boiling point of L. So if we have boiling point uh, elevation. So if you if you have solids or something dissolved uh, in your system with a different boiling point, if uh, what's ever in the solution is not volatile, uh, then you always have a boiling point elevation. Uh, if you have salt in water, it boils at a higher temperature and it melts as, at a lower temperature. Uh, and that's a colligative uh, property, so it's just the concentration that determines that. In the video on mass and energy balances uh, on uh, evaporators, we will uh, say that the error you make here, you push at all into the overall heat transfer coefficient and instead call that an apparent overall heat transfer coefficient. But more on that in that video.